I should turn your Bible to Daniel chapter 2 this morning. Daniel chapter number 2. Oh my God. We've asked them to sing that song, Dare to be a Daniel, as yeah. we're living in Daniel like times. We need some people that stand up and dare to be a Daniel. We want to look at how Daniel did what he did. Amazing testimony of Daniel. Daniel, I was under the under the thumb of two of the most powerful pagan leaders in the world, and yet brought both of them to faith in Christ. Think of it. That's amazing. Two of the most powerful men in the world that he was under their authority, and yet he, in both cases, he brought both of them to knowledge of a true and living God. And so, there's, I believe there's some great things we can learn from Daniel and how he dealt with this situation. Uh, we're looking at the practical part of it, but then as you study the book of Daniel, you know there's a historical part of it uh, that Daniel deals with that's very important to help us understand where we are today. The roots of where we are today started way back there in Babylon. And we begin to look at that and try to understand all that. And then there's the prophetic aspect of it. Where is this going to go? What's going to happen next? Where are we headed? And so we're looking at all of these as we study the book of Daniel. I'm, I know that we've already uh, looked at the first few verses of this chapter, but I want to go back by way of uh, reading the first uh, verses of the chapter to give you the context for what we'll be looking at today. In Daniel chapter 2, let me begin reading in verse number 1. And in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams, wherewith his spirit was troubled, and his sleep break from him. Then the king commanded to call the magicians and the astrologers and the sorcerers and the Chaldeans for to show the king his dreams. So they came and stood before the king. And the king said unto them, I have dreamed a dream, and my spirit was troubled to know the dream. Then spake the Chaldeans to the king in Syriac, O king, live forever. Tell thy servants the dream, and we will show the interpretation. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, The thing is gone from me. If ye will not make known unto me the dream with the interpretation thereof, ye shall be cut in pieces, and your houses shall be made a dunghill. Very gracious way of dealing with things that came up in his life. And uh, he says, Look, I had a dream, and I want you Chaldeans to, to tell me what the dream was, and then tell me the interpretation of the dream. And he said, if you can't do that, he said, we're going to cut you in pieces. We're going to put you through a meat slicer. And we're going to then bury you in a dunghill. I mean, that, that's uh, kind of, uh, you know, I, I heard about what they did with the bones of what John Tyndale, you know, they, well, they hung him and killed him and then they buried him and then they drowned him and then they cut him in pieces. I mean, they yep. want to make sure they got him real good. Yep. Uh, you know, the term we use, drawn and quartered, mm -hmm. has to do with somebody who's been killed and then cut up in quarter pieces to make sure they're dead. All right. Now here, he the king says, uh, "Ye shall be cut in pieces, and your houses shall be made a dunghill. But ye shall, but if ye shew the dream, verse six, and the interpretation thereof, ye shall receive of me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore, show me the dream and the interpretation thereof." They answered again and said, "Let the king tell his servants the dream, and we will show the interpretation of it." The king answered and said, I know the certainty that you would gain the time. Because you see the thing is gone from me. He said, I know you'd be happy to do it that way. Because you know I can't remember what it is. So you'll just, you'll, just, uh, uh, you'll just make up something and I won't have any way of knowing it's true or not. So you tell me what the dream is. But if you will not make known unto me the dream, there is but one decree for you. For ye have prepared lying and corrupt words to speak before me till the time be changed. Therefore tell me the dream and I shall know that ye can show me the interpretation thereof. And the Chaldeans answered before the king and said, There is not a man upon the earth that can show the king's matter. Please note that statement. There is not a man on the earth. There is not a man, but there is a God in heaven. Amen. Amen. There is not a man upon the earth that can show the king's matter. Therefore there is no king, lord, nor ruler, that asks such things as any magician or astrologer or Chaldean. And it is a rare thing that the king required. Then there is none other that can shew it before the king except the gods whose dwelling is not in this flesh. Not the gods, but the God. In verse 12, For this cause the king was angry and very furious and commanded to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. Wise men, by the way, is the term magi. Interesting when you come to study the life of Christ. 
And the, and the decree went forth that the wise men should be slain, and they sought Daniel and his fellows to be slain. Then Daniel answered with counsel and wisdom to Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, which was going forth to slay the wise men of Babylon. And he answered and said to Arioch, the king's captain, Why is the decree so hasty from the king? Then Arioch made the thing known to Daniel. And Daniel went in and desired of the king that he would give him time, and that he would show the king the interpretation. Now you understand that... Uh, Daniel was not one of the wise counselors at this time. He was not one of the wise men. He was still in training. Remember the, the boys of Israel and Jerusalem that were of royal descent. They were taken by Nebuchadnezzar, brought to Babylon to be re-educated, reoriented, and, and to be uh, re, uh, uh, retrained in the area of the Babylonian culture. And so... Uh, all those young men that were Jews went around along with that, except for four of them. We know Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego maintained their faithfulness to God. And uh, but that and uh, during this time of training, early on, remember we had in chapter one that they were not would appear before the king until this time of their training was up. But in the second year, verse one of this chapter says that Nebuchadnezzar had this dream. So only two years has gone into this, and Daniel's still not brought up to that level yet. What, what's recorded for us in the last part of chapter 1 has not transpired yet. He's just, he's just a kid. He was a teenager when he was brought there, so maybe he's 16 or 17 years old at the times of this. And so we find here that uh, the, cap, the king gives the order, all right, if you can't interpret my dream, you know, off with your head, you know. Um, we're going to kill a whole bunch of you. We're going to wipe out. We, don't, we can't trust any of you. And Daniel gets word of it. He's not there. He's not a part of this. But he gets word of it, realizing not only would the ones that are standing before the king be killed, but those young men that were in training would be killed too. They would all be killed. And so we find here uh, the, the threat now on their very lives. Look with me now in verse number 17. Then Daniel went to his house and made the thing known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. That's their names uh, uh, prior to the Babylonian names given to them. His companions that they would desire mercies of the God of heaven concerning this secret. That Daniel and his fellows should not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changed the times and the seasons. He removeth kings. He setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. He revealeth the deep and secret things. He knoweth what is in the darkness, and the light dwelleth with him. I thank thee, and praise thee, O thou God of my fathers, who has given me wisdom and might, and has made known unto me now what we desired of thee, for thou hast now made known unto us the king's matter. Now, we we'll find here, Daniel does three things. And this is very important for you and I today, uh, in light of our circumstances that we, we're dealing with. First of all, there was a prayer for mercy. Verses 17 to 18, uh, Daniel goes and he prays for mercy. He says in verse 18 that they would desire mercies of the God of heaven. He didn't see in himself, or Meshach and Shadrach and Abednego, he did not see in themselves any worthiness for God to do anything. Listen, we're unworthy people. And to think that uh, God should answer our prayers because somehow we are good folks. No. The truth is, we are sinners saved by grace. That's right. And uh, we, if, if God ever answered our prayers according to our worthiness, we would never get a prayer answered. Yes, sir. Because we don't, we're not worthy of God's answered prayers in our life. We desire mercy. Mm. Mercy. The tender mercies yes. of God is what we need. Uh, not God give us what we deserve. Right. We fail Him every day. But we need mercy. And then notice, not only was there a prayer for mercy, but there was a probe for the secret. I mean, he began to ask God about what, what is the secret of this thing? Lord, what, what, what can we do? What can I say to the king? And we need to look for answers. Don't, don't be satisfied not knowing the answers to life. Be, be a reader. Be one who's learned. Uh, you know, uh, 
Uh, you know, there's, there's a mentality to folks like you and me. There is a stereotype for folks who believe the Bible is the Word of God, word for word. People who believe that Jesus is God in the flesh. Yes. People who believe that there's only one way to heaven. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. That we are, we are presented by the world as being just kind of like half-wits. Yeah. No, duh, I just know that's what it does. And they think we're stupid. Some of the greatest minds I've ever met have been people who believe those very things. That's right. But yet you're presented as being stupid, uneducated, unscholarly. Uh, I remember in the in particular Bible college I went to, and it, when they presented those who believe the King James Bible, they're just a bunch of dumb hillbillies. Yeah. They don't know. They just sticks in the mud. They were unwilling to change. And I found out that wasn't the case. The scholarship is with your King James Bible. That's, That's right. What scholarship said. Scholarship is not picking up a, a Bible version. So, well, this is a little easier to read. Uh -huh. Well, that's not a good read. It just because it's easier to read. Because Come on. what you want to know is it true? What it Amen. says. And yet, that there's no scholarship there. Uh, may I say, probe for the secrets. Learn things. Find out information. Know the facts. Know the truth about things. Don't just don't fall in line. Uh, just be gullible to what everybody says. Find out the truth. Daniel, he, there was only one place he could go, and that's God. And that's where, we, no matter what the world tells you, check it out with what God has said. I mean, if your favorite politician says something, go to the Bible and find out if it's true. If your doctor says something, take it to the Bible and find out yeah, if it's true. Right. If your preacher says Come something, on. take it home to your Bible and find out if it's true. Mm -hmm. I mean, no matter who it is or what it is, let God be true in every man. Yes, sir. I mean, check it out. Probe for the secrets of life. Know the truth. And the Bible says the truth shall set you free. Amen. All right. The third thing they did was to praise God for wisdom. Wisdom. And uh, notice with me in verse 20 through 23. And Daniel answered said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are His. Praise God for wisdom. Wisdom is the ability to see things from the perspective of eternity. Wisdom is the ability to see things from God's perspective. Not our perspective. That's just temporal. Wisdom is seeing the whole picture in the eyes of eternal God. And so Daniel begins to praise him for wisdom. That's very important for what God shows him here in this vision. You have to see over a period of thousands of years in this vision. What what Daniel's revealed here about this vision that Nebuchadnezzar had is going to take him through empires. It's, this is a dream of empires. One to follow another. And we're going to see here, this is required wisdom. It's not just for today. It's for tomorrow. That's it's right. not for just tomorrow. It's for next year, yes. next decade, next hundred years. It's for eternity. Seeing things from the eternal perspective. That's right. Now, when we come to verse 24, we have the dream's interpretation explained. Now, we're not going to look at all of it. But I, I do want to introduce it and we'll look at the first part of this this morning. And we'll take up from there next time. But in verse 24 through 45 is the dream's explained meaning. What is this dream and what does it mean? Well, notice with me in verse 24. And we'll read down through um, verse 38. Therefore Daniel went in unto Arioch whom the king had ordained to destroy the wise men of Babylon, he went and said thus unto him, Destroy not the wise men of Babylon. Bring me in before the king, and I will shew unto the king the interpretation. Then Arioch brought in Daniel before the king in haste, and said thus unto him, I have found a man of the captives of Judah that will make known unto the king the interpretation. And the king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belshazzar, Art thou able to make known unto me the dream which I have seen and the interpretation thereof? Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king had demanded, cannot the wise men and the astrologers and the magicians and the soothsayers shew unto the king? Before Daniel answers his question, he has to take the dagger and twist it just a little bit. He said, uh, Excuse me, king? You've got all these counselors right here. Couldn't they do this? Yeah. Hey, uh, couldn't your soothsayers say something to help you understand this? How about your magicians? What are they here for? Why is he doing that? He's showing the contrast between those who get their information from God and those who are false and are corrupt and are liars. Yes, sir. 
And we ought to be quick to want to show the comparison of the two. Our God is true. Our Bible is true. And we have truth to deal with every matter. Every societal problem today could be answered. Somebody just get them a Bible and read it and follow it. But yet, uh, that, that's pushed aside. That's religion. We don't want religion as though religion means it's, it's automatically suspect. Now notice with me, Daniel says, well, King, what about all these fellows you got here on your payroll? Couldn't they help you? And notice then, verse 28, but there is a God. Notice they talked about gods earlier. Daniel says, no, there is a God yes. in heaven that reveals secrets and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Thy dream and the visions of thy head upon thy bed are these. Now Daniel's going to give the, the king his dream. He's going to tell him what he dreamed. He said, this is what you dreamed. And your dream pertains to the latter days. Your dream uh, pertains to things yet future. Verse 29, As for thee, O king, thy thoughts came into thy mind upon thy bed, what should come to pass hereafter. And he that revealeth secrets make known to thee what shall come to pass. But as for me, this secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have more than any living. But for their sakes, that shall make known the interpretation to the king, and that thou mightest know the thoughts of thy heart. Daniel says, King, the reason God has showed me these things is not because I'm smarter than anybody else. It's because God wants to speak to your heart. Game. God wants you to see that, that He is real and understand that what He says is true. And uh, verse 31, Thou, O King, sawest, and behold a great image, this great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. We find Daniel says to him, You saw a great big statue. He saw a huge statue. And he said the sight of the statue, the form of was terrible. It's frightening. It's powerful. Verse 32. This image head was made of fine gold. His breast and arms of silver. His belly and his thighs of brass. His legs of iron. His feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay and break them in pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the, stone, like the chaff of the summer threshing floors and the wind carried them away that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. He says, this is the dream. He said, he said that's what you saw. And I could, I could just imagine Nebuchadnezzar's eyes kind of opening up. He said, that's it, boy. You got it. Yeah. You got it right. That's, that's exactly what I dreamed. That was, that's the truth. You did it. You told me the truth. And then Daniel goes on to say, uh, this is the dream, and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Thou, O king, Art a king of kings. For the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beast of the field, and the fowls of the heaven, hath he given into thine hand, and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. I want us to look at that head of gold this morning for just a little bit. Now, Nebuchadnezzar, in his dream, he sees this terrible, large statue, and his, his statue is made up of metals of varying strengths and, and value. And the fact is, it's top heavy. Now, I'm not a scientist, and, but uh, the atomic weight, if we look at this, the atomic weight of gold is 197. Mm -hmm. The atomic weight of silver is 107. The atomic weight of brass is 63. The atomic weight of iron is 55. And the clay at, at the, at, is at least around a 10. 
So what you have, you have an image that's top heavy. Definitely. It's unstable. This big, huge, terrible <coughs> image. And at the top of it, it is a head that's made of gold. This head that's made of gold, <clears throat> Daniel tells him, he says, Nebuchadnezzar, that's you. Yeah. That's you. That represents you and the Babylonian kingdom. Now, please understand this. We, when we opened this book, we talked about Babylonianism, where it begins back at the Tower of Babel. And uh, it almost disappears as right out of uh, historical sight for a while. But when we come to uh, the days of Nebuchadnezzar and his father, that all of a sudden it is a great and powerful nation again. It's revived, if you would. It's a revived Babylonianism. And what, what we see here uh, in this vision is a, a, a nation that in its time is considered a world empire. They ruled the entire known world at the time. I mean, it's unbelievable the amount of power that Nebuchadnezzar had and the influence the Babylonian Empire had, the wealth that they had. And we're talking about uh, images and statues made of solid gold. The wealth that was possessed by Babylon. Now, the... Uh, in this, and we won't, I don't want to go ahead and get too many ahead in the other ones, but each one of those medals represents another empire. I want to say this uh, about Babylon and just say a few words to help us understand uh, this vision and what's been represented by the head of gold. This is the, of the nations of world dominion, Babylon is the first. Mm -hmm. it's, it goes back to the ancient Babylon, which was, that was their goal. You remember? To build a tower that you could reach all the way up into heaven without God. And God came down and confused the languages and uh, scattered the nations. But uh, with the revived Babylon, it's, it is a worldwide empire. It's all that the Tower of Babel wanted to be and more that's established here through Nebuchadnezzar. They, they have a, a religious system that uh, takes ancient rites. And, and so they didn't miss any. They brought all these counselors of various backgrounds. And so Babylon encompasses all of them, brings them all under the umbrella of the, the uh, sorcerers and the Chaldeans and the magicians, all under one great umbrella, what you might call ecumenicalism. No. Is established there. All these brought together under one great empire for one great religious power and one great political power. Babylon, its power and influence, all the known world. Now, it represents for us a the beginning of, of, in this vision that's revealed to us, this is only the beginning uh, and the foundation, if you would, if you want to think of a foundation that's kind of upside down, but uh, it is the beginning of a Gentile world kingdoms. Gentile world powers. And I want to look at it from three perspectives this morning. First of all, the practical. The practical context. When you see these three powers and their influence and their flexing of their muscles and, their, and the influence of that, those Gentile powers are still here, folks. They will not be gone until Christ's second coming. Amen. And this is known as the time of the Gentiles, according to Luke chapter 1, verse 24. Gentile world powers. We live under them. And there have been all kinds of little upstarts. You know, you've got Adolf Hitler thought he was going to rule the world, but he didn't get very far. And there have been all kinds of little groups and, uh, you know, Mussolini and, you know, and all these different ones that rose up. They're going to rule the world. But they didn't get far, very far. The ones it mentioned, they did it. Yeah. And they actually ruled the known world. They had that kind of power. And many of these uh, dictator upstarts, they like to imitate them. They want to think that they're like them. But these are the real ones that God says that are in place. And He uh, tells us of, of Nebuchadnezzar, God put you there. Daniel says. God, put you, God gave you your power. God gave you your nation. God gave you your influence. Now, we have to be very careful in the practical context of things that we do not fret. I, I, and I read this, even in the, at the point where it looks like Daniel could be called in and killed, 
I don't find Daniel chewing his fingernails. Mm -hmm. Do you? No, sir. I don't find Daniel saying, well, hey, Meshach, Shadrach, and Pedro, what are we going to do? Oh, they can, oh, what are we going to do now? I'm going to go check man down to, myself down to the mental ward. I, and get, you know, I got to get a pad of sale. I'm about to fall apart here. No! He didn't because he realized God had raised up Nebuchadnezzar. It's an important thing for us to realize when it comes to it. God raises up kings and takes down kings. Yeah. We don't. Right. We don't. And uh, it, it, sometimes we, in a society, in a form of government, we, have, we think that we do, but we really don't. It's God that does it. Mm -hmm. and, if God, and God raises them up for various reasons. And we'll find, you can't find uh, here at the beginning, uh, how nice would it be to be ripped out from your home, young people, as a teenager, taken hundreds of miles from home as a prisoner, and then uh, be placed with the eunuchs. And then be retrained, reoriented to everything that's right and wrong in your life, trying to get you to forget all the things your parents ever taught you and the influence of God that has ever taught you, to retrain you. Uh, what kind of government would you say that is? That's exactly what Daniel was taken into. That's exactly where he found himself. Our young people had better learn how to be Daniels because they're going to face these very things. You, we hear rumors all the time of these types of things that happen in other countries all the time of happening in our nation. So we better, young people need to be strong. Yes, that's right. You need to have some courage. You need to have great faith in God. You need to believe God and, and, and be skeptical about all the powers and authorities tell you, saying, well, they're just people. But I know a God who's always right. Yeah. And you understand? And, and learn to get some wisdom there. A practical context here. Pray for wisdom. Pray for wisdom. I love James chapter 1, verse 5. Any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God. Mm. And the Bible says he will give it to you ah, a little bit at a time. No, he says he'll give it to you liberally. That's the only time it's good to be a liberal. Amen? Yeah. Right, get some That's liberal right. wisdom. All right? Get some liberal wisdom. God says, I'll give it to you as much as you need. He said, Oh God, I need some wisdom. Face this situation. He said, That's all right, I got a whole truck load over here. Me, 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 me. Oh, dump it right out in your lap. Yes, sir. All the wisdom you need. You never have to lack for wisdom. Mm -hmm. I I have I see people all the time fretting, worried, what are we gonna do? Uh, number one, we need to ask God for wisdom. Ask God to see it from his perspective. And when we see it from his perspective, I guarantee God's not in heaven saying, Oh, Michael and Gabriel, what are we going to do down there? Things are out of hand. No! Why shouldn't we act that way? Daniel doesn't because he first asked for wisdom. Number two, in practical context, we had better pray for survival. Now, I, I, you know, I, I don't believe as a believer that we go through the tribulation period. I believe in it. Pre-trib rapture. Amen. I do not apologize for that position. Yeah. I believe I, I can support that scripturally, but understand something. That does not mean we will not have tribulations. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Jesus said, in the world ye shall have tribulations. Oh, yes. That does not mean that around the world, uh, this sounds funny to say this when you realize what's going on around the world, that we could be imprisoned for our faith. That sounds kind of foolish when you understand what's going on around. Christians already are being imprisoned for their faith. It sounds kind of silly to even say it. But we have been isolated, insulated in so many ways. What makes us think that somehow the things that touch other believers around the world will not someday touch us? I read the testimony a few years ago. Um, a little article with the Voices of the Martyrs about a young lady. Her and her teenage friends went out, a little, just went out camping, a little camping trip, had a little campfire, took some food to cook around the campfire, and some a group of uh, Muslims came and t took those girls and used them and abused those young ladies. And they took that little teenage girl who was the most godly of the bunch, they took her and roasted her over the fire while she was alive. She screamed and cried out while they laughed. She survived that ordeal. And listen, uh, if you think for a minute I'm a better Christian than she is, what makes me think that I somehow deserve not to be treated like she is? Listen, some of the best Christians in the world do not live in the United States of America. 
They live in places where every day of their lives they're under the threat of arrest and under the threat of being uh, persecuted or put to death. Listen, uh, listen, somehow we sometimes think we're insulated, but that could never happen here. Uh, pray tell, why not? Why couldn't that happen here? If it happened there, if it could happen anywhere, it could happen here. We live on the same globe. This ball called earth, don't we? We all live on the same globe. But what I'm saying is, but what we can do, we can learn to pray for wisdom like other Christians have had to do in other parts of the world, and then we can pray for survival. Listen, uh, pray for another day so that you can witness for Christ. Amen. Another day that you can live for Him. Another day that you can honor Him and glorify Him. Listen, the security of many things that we have had for many years, they're not going to be there much longer for us. Our security better come from God. Mm. And we need to teach our young people, trust in God. Trust in God. Trust in God. He won't fail you. He'll get you through it. He'll give you grace. He'll give you strength. So practical context here, we need to look at Daniel and see how Daniel handled it. He, went, he said, I need answers. God, you got them. I just need to go over there and they can get them. You're the one who has the answers. And he's got answers for your life or whatever you have to face down here. Uh, so there's the practical context. And then there's a historical context that we have to look at. Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom can pass the, the entire known world at the time. Uh, he ruled for 43 years until 562 B.C. Now, the kingdom then, after Nebuchadnezzar was gone, lasted 23 more years. But it only lasted, remember now, he ruled it for 43 years. And then after he dies, it lasted for 23 more years until 538 B.C. Now, think about this now. The Babylonian Empire didn't last all that many years. It didn't last that long at all. And yet, it was the foundation of all the Gentile empires that would come following. Now, the historical context is when one of these nations goes off the scene, they are not simply replaced. They, they take the, the characteristics of the nation before them and they bring them with them into each one. These are a continued succession. Babylonianism does not end when Babylon ends. Yes, sir. It continues on into the next nation. That's right. It simply embraces the next nation. Mm -hmm. And Babylonianism has, is still here. That's why when we get to Revelation chapter 17 and 18, it talks about Babylon, the great. So Babylon? Where's Babylon? I thought Babylon was defeated way back there. Babylon's never been defeated. It just continues to succeed into other nations and continues on. You and I have to deal with Babylon just like Daniel had to deal with Babylon. And we see one embracing the next and embracing the next and embracing the next. In the historical context of Daniel was living in the time when the Gentile empires were their strongest. Because remember, they deteriorate as they come down. They're a little weaker. They don't have quite the uh, dominion that the first one had. Uh, that first nation, which is Babylon or Nebuchadnezzar, each nation is a little weaker and a little weaker. Daniel lived in the most powerful one. And if what he did worked in the most under the influence of the most powerful Gentile empire, then you and I ought to be able to survive and work in what is the <laughs> weakest of the Gentile empires. Because they get a little weaker and a little weaker and a little weaker. Now, we, we, want, we like to think that somehow, you know, uh, one nation is exempt from this, another nation don't. This is worldwide, folks. This is global. We, we're dealing with something global. Uh, many of us, like myself, grew up in a little small rural area. And uh, my mother very seldom ever left my county that I grew up in. Maybe once a year she may leave the county. Never went very far from where she grew up. And it was not uncommon for many years if somebody grew up in a certain area that their children would find a place to live nearby and they lived in the same area. And for people, but we live in a time, and Daniel talks about this later when there's an increase in knowledge, increase in travel. 
Hey, I could get on an airplane and be in California just a few hours. When it might take months to form. I might, it might take me a year if I took off to Europe years ago to get to Europe. But now, I could be there in hours. We live in a time. I, I was reading about the, the first trains. And I was joking about this. My wife yesterday, when she was driving, about I'm going to do fast, her heart might stop. But, uh, you know, they said that, that we would not be able to ride on these locomotives, you know, these newfangled locomotives. They travel as much as 30 and 35 miles per hour, and the human heart could not stand that. <laughs> Sounds funny to us now, doesn't it? But uh, the truth is, uh, that was only, what? Just, just a couple hundred years ago. All these advancements have come about since around 1900. Until about 1900, how did you travel? You walked or you rode an animal. That's right. And then, with the technology that God said would happen as we enter the last stages of the latter days, this increase of technology. We, I mean, uh, <clears throat> people have been to the moon. Mm -hmm. People, uh, these, these planes flying through space at the speeds that are just unbelievable. We have the increase of technology. When I was out living out in the country, I, I couldn't imagine. Somebody mentioned New York City. That was like another foreign country compared to where I grew up. This is so sound crazy. I can remember as a little boy standing in the front yard watching an airplane fly over and being amazed by it. <laughs> I thought it was down there. I, way, I thought that was, in, I was out flying a kite. I remember it specifically. The day I was out there and this airplane went over it. I had, as far as I know, I had never seen one before that day. Now, I'm, I wasn't born in the 1600s, but I lived out in the country, we're isolated uh, from the things of what's going on in the rest of the world. Nobody's isolated anymore. Even the most rural regions, they have these cell phones that they could put something on a camera and see it on the other side of the world in a matter of seconds. Mm. There are no isolated people anymore. We are globally connected. The stage has been set for this Babylonianism to spread out its, its tentacles and spread out its influence. And it's not just a little thing. It's in every human being's life. It's in every nation. It's in every little village. It's in every little community. It's everywhere. I can remember not that long ago when you could tell the kids that were from rural America from, from urban America. You know, you see some kid from the city has got his hat cocked, you know. No country kid would have been caught dead looking like that. And now you go out in the middle of the stick somewhere and there's some kid with his pants hanging down the back and his hat on his head sideways and say, where do you learn that at? Because it's global. Our cultures are global. You can't escape it. Now, this, this influence of Babylonianism because of the technology increase of our day means its influence spreads. Many of us, the only influence in our lives until we got to be a certain age was mom and dad. Nobody else really influenced our life. Somebody said, well, what about television? Uh, when I was growing up, we had a television. Uh, you got three channels on it. And then, if you, that was only if you hang out the window and turn the antenna just right, you could get three stations. Some of you remember those days? My dad would say, a little to the left, and we're hanging out there, a little to the right, until we could pick up the ball game that he's trying to watch. But we, people didn't sit around and watch television. There was not the 24-hour news. And so we weren't influenced by Hollywood so much because the only way you got influenced by Hollywood is if you had a 50 cents or something went down to the movie theater and, in, and Hollywood influenced you. You didn't get it from television because there was nothing on the television. It was just, shh. You remember when, when, the, when everything went off after the news? Yeah. Night? Shh. You said, well, what was on there after that? Nothing. Nothing. Imagine. <laughs> Almost three channels. And you didn't have nothing. No. And they come on the Star Spangled Banner. You yep. know it's about the end of the day. <laughs> Today, 24 hours, a kid could sneak around and turn that box on and get their head filled with the globalism of, of, of immorality that's all over the world. And it's in their brain and their parents don't even know it's in their bedroom. Wow. It's like bringing in the most crooked, wicked people in the whole world and putting them in your child's bedroom to train them while you sleep. Now, this global influence is there. And we find the historical context, one is going to go into the other, and into the other, and to the other, and its power is going out. 
You say, but what can we do? I pray for wisdom. What can we do? Pray for survival. Like Daniel did. It worked out pretty good for Daniel too, didn't it? Yes, sir. And we find there's the historical context and then lastly there's the prophetic context. This is called the times of the Gentiles. Now, you understand if you're here today and you're not Jewish, you're Gentile. No. God divides up the people. He doesn't divide them up in Japanese, Americans, Australian. He divides them up Jews and Gentiles. And uh, you understand, this is the time the Gentile reign. And the you want to know what the Gentile reign is? Read, um, read Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1 describes you the Gentiles, the wickedness of the Gentiles, the profane, the, uh, the uh, idea that we're dealing with today of the uh, homosexuality, the belief in evolution, that comes from the Gentile reign of Romans chapter 1. It tells you where it all starts from, how it all develops. It's, it, and, they, and we find this: there is a progression of division of sovereignty and it just keeps coming down and down and down. And we're only, you know, see, people say, understand, said, nothing's really changed. Nothing's really changed. Uh, someone said, the only thing we learn from history is that we do not learn from history. No. So we are doomed to repeat the same mistakes that people made generation after generation after generation when dealing with these things because we do not learn from them. We ought to be taking the book of Daniel. We ought to be Daniel under a microscope So I want to see how that boy did it. I want to know how Daniel did it. I'm going to need to stand in my day. But we don't do that. Well, well the, there are people who won't even read their Bible. Won't go through, they'll go week after week and never get into the Word of God to find out how they can live in the day that they live in. We see here the, pro, the progressive division of sovereignty. They're, we're living prophetically. There's a progression deterioration in the character of the rulers. The Remember the, the value of the metals. If you take all those metals and stack them up, the most valuable of those metals is gold. Yeah. The least value is clay. Mm -hmm. I mean, you probably got clay in your yard. You'd be happy to sell somebody. Somebody want to give you the price of gold for it, wouldn't you? I mean, you go out there to the shelves and you have all you want, you know. But the clay is not worth much. And so, may I say this? The the character is deteriorating. The character. There there is a greatness that is leaving. You remember when the word honor meant something in life? Integrity meant something? People live by it. I'm talking about ungodly people live by it. Honor. Integrity. Decency. Yeah. I'm not talking about just born again Christians. Oh. I'm just talking about unsaved people. Yeah. They believed your word was your bond. Yep. My dad was not a Christian. My dad gave you his word we didn't have to worry about it. That's right. You remember the days when you folks remember you could go down and buy something and you didn't even have to sign your name because the person gave them their word and, and shook their hand? Mm -hmm. You better not do that today. They'll steal your hand. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's no integrity. And we're losing integrity. Uh, I talked to, uh, I'm in connection with several Bible colleges, talked to a lot of people in different Bible colleges. In Bible colleges today, they're having trouble with students cheating. In Bible colleges, the students coming in and they think it's all right to cheat. And if, when they get in trouble for it, they say, I don't see anything wrong with it. I don't see anything wrong with it. I'm just being resourceful. And the internet has made it easier to cheat because it's all out there. And I'm saying, you know, say the, the character of our, is deteriorating. With every one of these nations, character deteriorating. And you're going to see it worse. Where a person's word means nothing. A promise means nothing. Mm. And boy, it's at, the, it's at the church house too. When, you, when Christians say things that don't mean it, they don't mean it. When, there used to be a time when somebody said, I'll be in church on Sunday. You just knew that the back of the door, I'm getting ready to read them, they're coming. People say that all the time. Half the people we say, I'm going to be in church on Sunday. I've never seen it. If I wave back and held my breath, <laughs> I'd be I passed out on the floor, waiting for them to come in the door, because their word meant nothing. That's right. Their word meant absolutely nothing at all. Our word is our bond. But we're seeing this breaking down as with, with each one of these, the deterioration of the morality breaking down. Until the words of people, the integrity of people is nothing. It is a progressive division of sovereignty. 
It is a progression, a succession of world domination. That's a gen time of the Gentiles. It's a progression of deterioration. But I do want you to notice this. If you study those metals, starting with the gold, there is a progression of hardness. Gold's not that hard. You can scratch it. Iron's very hard. Though they are lighter at the bottom, they are stronger at the bottom. In other words, as we see nations follow nations leading up to the end of the times of Gentiles, nations rule with a rod of iron. They rule with an iron fist, forcing people <coughs> under their demand. Forcing people. The ideal of, 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 of just mere, mere force. In fact, in Daniel later on, you're going to see there's a term talking about the religion of the last days. It says they worship the God of forces. Mm. The God, of, isn't it funny that if you have a meeting with some people about bullying, you know what their solution is? Go in and bully the bullies. <laughs> We're going to make you straight up. They start bullying them. Our solution for bullying is bully. And today, everything's about a force of power. We talked about the public school sometime. I'm talking about this retraining where the uh, president of the NEA, National Education yeah. Association, made this statement and said those, these people like you and I, we think it's about the children. He said it's not about the children. That's what he said. It's about power and we have it. Power and forces. Politician gets elected. We don't care what you think. We have the power. We have the power. Someone... And, and understand, a person gets in a position of leadership. I've got the power now. Listen, a position of leadership is not supposed to be about power. It's about ministry. You're supposed to be, the, the greatest are supposed to be the servants. But that's not the idea today. The greatest are supposed to have the power. I can make you do what I want. <coughs> I'll force you. You just wear the mask. Yeah. That's exactly what this is talking about. Don't you question me. I'm in power. I don't care if it's a dove catcher. I don't care uh, what position in the community is, whether it's a preacher or it's a, uh, a, a local politician or it's a state ruler or a politician or a, a federal government. When they say, I've got the power and I'm sick to it. You know what? They're practicing Babylonianism. Mm. And it's going to get more. And they're flexing their muscles because Babylonianism gets more more fierce and powerful as it builds into these other nations coming down to the very end of the time of Gentiles where we see there's no reasoning. In fact, you ever try to reason with somebody about something in these days? And they, they, it's hard to reason with somebody. So, but what about that? Why well, this is what I think. I, well, but what about, well, I don't care what that is. And you cannot have a reasonable discussion. I love debate. But it's hard to debate anything with anybody. Because as soon as you start discussing it, they get angry and, and treat you like you are some kind of moron for even questioning them what they said. And so this is the fruitation that we're seeing coming all the way back to Daniel dealt with, it, but it's getting more powerful and stronger. Each one of those metals is, is harder and harder and harder and harder. And you and I must do what Daniel did. That's right. And it's very inception. We better learn to pray. Mm -hmm. And specifically, he, Daniel didn't pray, God, give me enough money that I can buy power to overthrow Nebuchadnezzar. That's not what he prayed for. He didn't say, God, make me a fierce fighting machine. Make me a Rambo. Yeah. That I could go and, ah, you know, straight down. Ah, he prayed for wisdom. That's what we're to be praying for. Wisdom. And we need wisdom. You know, wisdom's good in any age. That's right. Wisdom's good for today. And we need wisdom. Will we be humble enough to ask God for it? But preacher, I already know what we need to do. You do, and you must be brilliant because you don't know what it does. We better ask God. We better pray. Seek His face. Just like Daniel did. Now next time we're going to get into the, the arms of silver. Where Babylonian goes in from there, 
and to the next stage of it. But to understand, it begins with Babylon. It begins in the context of where Daniel's at so that we can learn for every stage the same truths work. What worked in Babylon will work in every stage of this great image. It is the very things that the New Testament tells us that we're supposed to be doing today. It still works. The old Bible still works, doesn't yeah. it? Christianity still works. No, how, no matter how dark the days, the truths of the Word of God are still effective. Our Father, we pray so take the thoughts today and help us, Lord, as we in our day have to be Daniels. And Lord, what a privilege it is to be a Daniel. Yes, Lord. Lord, to be able to, to our generation to stand like Daniel stood. <laughs> help us, Lord. Lord, you know our weaknesses. And you know that we, if we're to do that, it's going to be because of your mercy. We are so unworthy. We are not able. But Lord, we believe that you are a God who will give wisdom if we'll just simply humbly ask. And not trust in our own knowledge and trust in our own insights and our own feelings and our own fears and, and panic. Help us, Lord, just to trust in you. Yeah. Asking for wisdom. And then acting upon what you show us, Lord. Help us now, Lord, like you helped Daniel. But we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand on our feet.